Day 553 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia sits on more than 262,000 military personnel losses, which represents an additional 570 in the past 24 hours. Then as for hardware losses, 9 tanks, 17 APVs, and a continuing whopping 26 artillery. Oh, and do note, a milestone of 500 Russian air defense systems was reached recently as well. Ironically, the very things that should be capable of protecting themselves from aerial threats. But there is nuance. One such nuance is the air-to-surface AGM-88 air defense busting missiles that are operated by the Ukrainian Air Force, which are designed to home in on and destroy enemy radar systems. Although HIMARS and drone strikes will also do the trick too, uh, more often than not. Then we'll head back across to the map and uh, with big news in Russia today as Ukraine shot an unprecedented amount of drones into Russia overnight with devastating impact. And the most successful of the strikes was quite far north in Russia's Peskov region, so at the Bavovna airport, or rather military airbase which saw the complete destruction of at least two Russian IL-76 transport aircraft, and possibly two to four more were damaged irreparably as well. Additionally, reports of successful strikes on the Cheryokino military base nearby were reported as well. As for the airfield, Russian media, of course, started out publicly stating there was just some aircraft damage and nothing to see here. But remember, this photo here was the state of the Russian plane from last week when they said it was just damaged. But as for this Peskov Oblast airbase, some other Russian media outlets eventually said that some of the IL-76s were engulfed in flames. Then we also saw some footage of two of the mammoth military transport aircraft burning into the night. No casualties reported either. Surgical precision military strikes, the way it should be. Russian telegram sources were also pretty straightforward about the event, saying that five planes were destroyed, including four of those mammoth transport aircraft and even one long-range Tu-22 strike aircraft as well. And the cost of these Bamos, about 50 million US dollars a piece. Not to mention they take about two years to produce. And the actual amount in Russia's inventory is certainly up for some debate or speculation, but operationally speaking, they might have 40 to 60 available. And so four or so of these IL-76s, these losses, would equate to roughly 200 million US dollars, with many analysts now seriously questioning Russia's ability to, to even produce these planes, or, or much of anything else, given the strict sanctions imposed on the country, therefore potentially making these losses that we see here today priceless. And the implications for Ukrainian strikes like these into the Russian mainland military sites are, are, mon are monumentally significant. We've not seen anything this large at this scale and timed so impeccably in relation to the additional drone strikes into the other Russian oblasts as well, including Bryansk, Oryol, Rezan, Moscow, and Tula. Not to mention strikes into occupied Crimea at about the same time as well. So Ukraine is striking at such a high frequency now that it would send a shiver down the, the Russian war machine's spine. In fact, one Russian telegrammer, Igor Gazenko, was so impressed by the drone exhibition last night that he isn't sure about, quote, some kind of victory anymore. 
This has to be terribly embarrassing for the Russian military as their air defences were clearly inundated with dozens of Ukrainian drones. As such, their defences simply couldn't handle these types of large-scale attacks that they have dished out to Ukraine so many times before. And I really hope in popular discourse that Russia's overall invasion will be known as the Three-Day War to ridicule the poor performance of the Russian military, both offensively and defensively. Because while Russia has been hitting residential buildings and grain silos within Ukraine of late, Ukraine has instead been putting on display how to actually strike at the enemy's military infrastructure. So once again, it's those Russian chickens I've been talking so much about recently that are still coming home to roost. Therefore, Russia will have to think twice about striking Ukraine's energy infrastructure this winter if Ukraine can strike back and plunge Russia into darkness too. You see, deterrence is a strategic military asset all on its own. In the end, the Ukrainian forces plan to strike deeper and deeper into Russian military locations, especially air bases, which could foreseeably neutralize Russia's capability to fire its air-to-surface salvos of missiles into Ukraine. And Ukraine is just getting started as they ramp up their, continue to really ramp up their drone production. We will see a lot more of this. Then, also in Russia, another transport aircraft succumbed to a fiery demise. This time it was a Mi-8 helicopter in the Shelabinsk region. In fact, this one actually had nothing to do with any military conflict, unless you consider a military maintenance contract misappropriation of funds, a military conflict, which technically it sort of is. Then we'll head back over to the Ukrainian map today, as there's been a bit of activity in the north, for instance. Uh, so I'll zoom right in there. As just northwest of Savivka, uh, just on the, in the Luhansk Oblast border, another Russian Mr. S 152mm uh, self-propelled howitzer was destroyed by an FPV loitering munition strike, which led to the detonation of ammo on board. But also, another Russian Mr. S was also hit nearby uh, to the same location as well. So, drones, drones, drones. This is the changing landscape of war that we all now see and understand. Then we'll head across to the southern axis as heavy clashes continue into the Melitopol direction. So we'll just scoot on all the way over there. But also, more than this map shows, the Ukrainian army has reached the western outskirts of Vibova. But also, if we do take a look at the date map, we'll see that the Russia's front line in this location has indeed been pushed back closer to that settlement. Then also in the south, Russia lost a 203mm 2C7 Peon SPG, but then also a very rare 9S36 unit of a Book M3 air defense system, which perished to a blazing expiration. And as far as that one goes, uh, the unit piece is around 40 million US dollars. And not many of these vehicles, which were introduced in just in 2015, were ever produced. But not to be outdone, a Russian electronic anti-drone station in southern Ukraine was hit by a HIMARS Gimlars strike. With this Predal E long-range radar system being worth around 200 million US dollars. Ouch. So, as you can see, this has probably been one of the most costly days for Russia in this war this year, from a monetary standpoint at least, and perhaps one of the most costly 24 hours throughout the entire war. And just for some additional context here, 
Counter drone measures usually work by jamming the drone's frequency or connection to their operators, but that isn't going to do jack all against a Gimlars missile that has already locked onto its target. Then we'll head across to the uh, Kursan Oblast right next door there, as some units of the AFU are still very much positioned on the left bank of the Dnipro River which is just south of the river where Russia would really expect to or want to keep a lid on. In fact, we have some nice footage of a Ukrainian soldier on the left bank who noticed an empty flagpole with a Ukrainian trident and decided to raise the national flag over it. Meanwhile, in the rest of the map, Ukraine intercepted all 28 of the Russian cruise missiles overnight, and 15 out of 16 of the drones as well sent their way. And most of what I just mentioned had a particular focus on the Kyiv capital. But there was one nice photo of a Kaliber cruise missile headed to Odessa, uh, and this one was in the Black Sea that was neutralized as well, with no successful strikes on the city. And I really think historians may one day pinpoint August 30th as one of the few days within the war where they decisively saw the change in the balance of power for this war. Because from a raw stats point of view, both sides fired dozens of drones and or missiles into the other's territory, but only one side neutralized 95% of the attacks and only one side has some pretty significant strategic successes as well. Then we'll head across to some news for today. We'll start out with a Ukrainian hardware update. So Greece is planning to transfer 100 Leopard 1 tanks to Germany. Then after modernization, they will be sent to Ukraine. So these Leopard 1A5s will be fitted with modern thermal images, which are also used on the Leopard 2s. The tanks will also receive additional armor, which is great because apart from these Leopard 1s having great mobility, excellent reliability, a main gun that fires a variety of ammo, the original stock armor on, on these were otherwise underwhelming. Meanwhile, as for some Russian hardware news, according to Russian media last week, horses were <laughs> delivered to the Russian frontline combat units used for weapons transportation. I apologize when I try not to laugh, I just laugh even more. So just give up, Russia. Give up with that tiny little morsel of dignity that you still have. Well, probably don't have, but maybe you still get to keep your country. I mean, the odds are okay on that front at least. Then in some other news, this one is interesting as Putin won't be traveling to represent Russia at the next G20 summit held in India. And your first thought might be that India could arrest him due to the ICC warrant on Putin's head, but India is actually not an ICC member with zero obligation to arrest Putin. But I also accept that Putin would have no interest in even making eye contact with pretty much every head of state that attends the New Delhi summit. Plus, Putin has got much bigger problems on the home front anyway right now, as he just put his security forces on high alert, standby, fearing a possible Wagner-led insurgency on the domestic front. Because with paranoid Putin worried about the possibility of a repeat of the Wagner hardliners march for justice, just like the events in June, the Russian president ordered his security service to take steps to prevent such an event in the future. Then in a quick final funny to round it all off with today guys, just a, a super short one, but Russia's latest enemy, it seems, is Russian military bloggers, of course. As the Kremlin is now attempting to obstruct their posting habits about the war, as their rhetoric is becoming increasingly anti-Kremlin and negative towards the, the Russian army. But that's no surprise really, is it now, as this is almost Putin's full-time job now. Silencing all of those internally critical elements of the country. My goodness, Putin is just drowning in a laundry list of potential adversaries right now. 
the the public unrest, uh, the military bloggers, the Wagner forces, the ICC. Oh, and I didn't even mention the big one, the armed forces of Ukraine. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like, comment, and subscribe if not already. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.